Daniel 6, beginning at verse number 16, and we will read through verse 24. I'll put it on the screen for those in the house of God that do not have a Bible. And the word of the Lord today reads, Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions. Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel, and hath shut the lions' mouths, that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocence, innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces, or ever they came at the bottom of the den. My Lord, have mercy. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, Father, once again, God, we thank you for the wonderful presence of the Holy Ghost that we have indeed felt in the house of God today. There is, in fact, and in truth, sunlight, sunlight in my soul today, sunlight, sunlight all along the way since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of his love within Master, the word of God must needs go forth at this hour, and it is impossible for any man or any woman, any child, to present the word of God in a manner that is able to touch hearts and not just hearing. It is not possible that human lips can do the divine uh, word of God any justice or any service except for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I need you, God, to touch me today. I need you, Lord, to help me to deliver the Word of God. Lord, you know my heart today, and there is nothing that I desire more than to be effective in communicating a message from heaven to the people of God. Touch the ear, O God, of every hearer. Let our hearts, our mind, our soul today be prepared to receive from the Word of God that we might grow in our faith and that we might grow God in righteousness and truth and in true holiness. We ask it all and none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. We know the story of Daniel. There's very few of us. I don't care who you are. Uh, you can be 
Hindu, you can be Muslim, you can be Buddhist, and most people are familiar with the story of Daniel in the lion's den. You've heard it, whether you believe in it or not, whether you think it actually occurred or not, that may be a different thing. But for those of us today who are Bible believers, and I count myself among them, Amen. I believe this did indeed happen. Daniel was a captive in Babylon. He had grown up in the ranks. He came into the favor of the king. The king admired him and appreciated him, and he elevated him. Uh, to such a high degree that many in the kingdom became jealous. Isn't it funny how when God blesses you and God elevates you, how there are others who tend to become jealous. There are others who tend to become a little bit angry and upset. Uh, they don't understand why it is that the king hasn't shown favor upon them as he has upon you. They don't realize that your favor comes from a higher source. Amen. Your favor's not coming from the king. Your favor's coming from the king of kings. Hallelujah. And we all are familiar with the story of Daniel. And we know how that, in essence, he was framed. He was set up. Many of the rulers in the kingdom, the lords, the people of high position... They knew, Tommy, that Daniel prayed every day, often, and he would open the window toward the east. This is a common practice uh, among Jewish people because they want to face the temple of God in Jerusalem. You want to face the temple. And Daniel would open that window and he would pray. So he wasn't doing it in secret. He wasn't doing it in hiding. The people of Babylon knew good and well Daniel was a Jew. He was a man of God and he was devout in his faith. Well, they set up a little program where... Uh, an idol was set up in the name of the king, you know, to glorify the king. And it was said that when you heard all this music being played, that everybody in the kingdom at that moment in time was to get down and begin to pray and worship uh, at this idol. Well, Daniel wasn't about to do that. And he didn't. And when it came time for him to pray as he had always prayed, he'd open the window as he had always opened the window, and he began to pray to the God of Israel, Jehovah, Elohim, Yahweh. And he began to pray. And all of a sudden the lords went to the king and said, Oh, king, look! This guy's not doing according to the law that you established. He's not following the rules. There are a lot of people in the LGBT community today who get ticked off at this preacher because a lot of times I say things that aren't following the rules of society. Hello now. You see, popular society does not dictate to me, Johnny, how I dress. Popular society does not dictate to me how I act. Popular society does not tell me today how I am to conduct myself. No, I'm not a bar person. I'm not a club person. I'm sorry if you're part of the LGBT community in Dallas, Texas. You're not going to bump into me in a nightclub. You're not going to bump into me in a bar room. Now, I'm not condemning anybody that's there. That's not the intent of what I'm saying. But that is not part of my my lifestyle. Nor will you see me down cruising in Oak Lawn. I purposely make a habit of not going into that neighborhood, not because I'm afraid I'll do something I shouldn't do or anything like that. The Bible said to abstain from all appearance of evil. I don't want anybody coming along and suggesting I saw him driving his pickup truck down. Uh, you know, all they have to do, Johnny, is see you driving down uh, Oakland Avenue or driving down Cedar Springs, and all of a sudden you're cruising. You know what I'm talking about? You know how people do. When I would drive for Uber and Lyft, I would wind up quite a bit in uh, 
Oak Lawn and what have you. And that's fine. I was earning a living. I was making money. You know, I was driving customers about. Only God knows if some nut saw me and made up something because I had somebody in the back seat of my car. I don't know. But uh, people will make up stuff, won't they, to try to catch you. They love to, they love to talk trash. Well, Daniel was set up. And ultimately, it broke the king's heart because he hadn't really thought about when he set up this decree that was going to make him feel so good about himself, you know. He hadn't thought about how that was going to impact a man like Daniel. He did. You know, a lot of times people do things and they don't think it through entirely. They don't think about, well, you know, I've got this man in my kingdom that I think very highly of, and he doesn't worship our gods, and he doesn't think the way we think, and he doesn't act the way we act. And if I make this decree, well, that's kind of going to put Daniel in a pickle. Well, the king hadn't thought about that. And when his lords and those in his kingdom came to him and said, look, Daniel has broken the rule. He's not following the decree, O king. And according to our rules, when you make a decree of this nature, it cannot be reversed. And you said anybody that doesn't follow the rule, anybody that doesn't bow at the time of the music, said they're to be thrown in the lion's den. Well, from the very beginning of our reading today, you'll notice that the king, it says, now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Hallelujah. Even the king knew. Daniel, you are too faithful to your faith. You are too faithful to your religion. You are too faithful to your God. I highly doubt he's going to leave you high and dry. You know, it's sad when people around us sometimes know better than we do that God isn't going to fail us. Hallelujah. Amen. Isn't it sad when people around us are looking at us and they're saying, well, I'm sure God's going to come through for you. Amen. I remember one time, this probably doesn't have anything to do with what I'm talking about, but you know I'm old and I get off track sometimes. I told the story how that when I was in high school, there was a teacher, an uh, English teacher, and we had two lunch periods in our high school in Fort Worth, Amon Carter Riverside High School on Yucca. And uh, we had two lunch periods, and we had English class during the first lunch period, and uh, then we had lunch during the second lunch period. Well, one day our teacher was needing to do something uh, that she had to get done, and she told the class, she said, listen, if I let y'all go to lunch right now for the first lunch period, do y'all promise to come back to class during the second lunch period? So she just wanted to shift our lunch period so she could get done what she needed to get done, and we'd have class. So we, of course, everybody, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll do that, we'll do that. And so we all go to lunch, and the second lunch period, I come back to the classroom and I'm sitting there and it's just me and Miss McCowan and not one single other student showed up not a single other student showed and Miss McCowan looked at me she said well she said I guess it was kind of dumb of me to think that people were going to keep their words she said you know technically they're not breaking the rule because technically they have second lunch you know she said so in essence they can just say, well, she dismissed everybody, you know, early, so we went to lunch, then we had second lunch, you know. And I looked at her, Johnny, and I said to her, I said, well, do you suppose that the rapture's taking place and I'm the only one that's been left behind? <laughs> Miss McCowan, bless her heart, went hysterical. She started to laugh and laugh and laugh. She really did. She started to laugh. She could barely catch her breath. And when she finally caught her breath, she said, Oh, Charles, she said, Oh, that's the funniest thing you could ever say. She said, Oh, my God. She said, If there's anybody on this planet that be in the rapture, it's you. She said, And, and that is the funniest thing I've ever See, sometimes people around us know good and well they see our faithfulness. And I tell them the truth. They see our devotion. And they know God ain't going 
going to fail us. If he fails anybody, he's not going to fail us. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there are times when I've been going through a burden or going through a struggle or going through a trial or a tribulation, and somebody has said to me, Brother, you know God is not going to fail you. You've been too faithful. Hallelujah. You have been too consistent. And this king said to Daniel, Daniel, the God that you serve surely is able to deliver you in this situation. You've been too faithful. Hallelujah. Daniel's thrown into the lion's den. And they sealed the top of the den and the Lord's the high men in the kingdom as well as the king, you know, they drip large quantities of wax onto the crack between the stone and that which is underneath it. And then they press their signet ring into that wax. It's kind of like what we would call today police tape. In other words, don't you dare break this. Don't you dare open this. Because on the authority, not only of the king, but on the authority of all the lords in the kingdom, this den has been sealed. And boy, I mean to tell you, you don't want to take your life in your own hands by trying to rescue Daniel. You don't want to take your life in your own hands by breaking that seal. The word of God said the king, you know it's funny, but this part of the story of Daniel has more to do with the king sometimes than it does Daniel. Talks more about the king than it does Daniel, doesn't it? Doesn't tell us how Daniel spent the night. It doesn't tell us whether Daniel pet the lions and uh, let them lick his hand and lay down and put his head upon the lion. We don't read any of that in this story. But instead, we hear about how the king spent the night. Amen. And the king spent the night worried and frustrated probably like so many of us he was as frustrated with himself as he was anybody because it was his foolishness that put Daniel in this spot and the Bible said he spent the night fasting he didn't he couldn't eat a midnight snack he didn't buy you know he didn't try to quell his worries with food you know a lot of us turn to food when we get a little upset well, he was upset, but he didn't turn to food. He didn't turn to music. He didn't want anything to try to calm himself because he was living in his guilt. He knew it was his fault that Daniel was in this position. And the Word of God tells us that early in the morning, poor king, he couldn't wait too long. Early in the morning, he rushes down to this den and he tells his servants, peel away that stone, break the seals, and peel away the stone. Now he's the king, so he's the only one that could do this. And they moved the stone away from the mouth of the den of lions, and the king, interestingly enough, yells out, Daniel! Is the God that you serve continually able to deliver thee? Has he done what I said he probably would do? Let's put it that way. It's funny that he called out for Daniel. He didn't say, Daniel, 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 waiting to see if he even heard a voice, waiting to see if there was any response whatsoever. I mean, I'm going to tell you, this king expected an answer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, he, he wasn't just trying to see if Daniel was still alive. He, he kind of anticipated Daniel was going to be alive. Like I said, sometimes the observers know good and well our God's not going to fail us. Right. All of a sudden, Daniel cries out and says, Oh, king, live forever. That's a, that's a common way of addressing the king. Whenever you address the king, you always add on, live forever. You know, you, you, you gotta you gotta show the right respect and you gotta even in Daniel and the lion's den, he's still following protocol. <laughs> he says, Oh king, live forever. Said, got news for you. Said the God that I serve sent his angel, hallelujah, and he shut up the lion's mouth. Hallelujah. He closed the lion's mouth, so the lions have done me no harm. The king says, haul that man up out of that. 
haul him up out of that den. And they brought Daniel up out of that den. And the king was so mad at the men who had set Daniel up for this failure that he commanded that these men and their families, I'm telling you, some of them old kings in ancient times, if you've studied uh, even secular history, you know that a lot of those old rulers, you know, they could be tyrants, they could be awful. He took their children, he took their wives, he took their entire families, and had them thrown into the lion's den. And here's the interesting thing. The Bible said that even as they fell into the den of lions, the lions began to pounce on them and break their bones and devour them from the minute they hit the ground. So it wasn't like those lions weren't hungry. It wasn't like those lions were just in a passive mood. No, they just wasn't going to touch Daniel because God had done something. I want to tell you today, folks, there are times when things come into your life, when things happen that you are not in control of, that you're not able to prevent from happening but oh, if we'll just be faithful, if we'll just be consistent in our faith, God's going to come through for us. It doesn't matter if cancer comes on you or not. That just means you're in the lion's den. But the cancer's not going to take you. Hallelujah! Because God has shut up the mouth of the lion. Hallelujah! Oh, praise the Lord! You say, oh, but brother, I've been struggling with addiction. I've been struggling with drugs. I've been struggling with alcohol. Let me tell you something. No matter how much the lion roars... The lion will not destroy you. It will not devour you. God is going to bring you out of the lion's den. Hallelujah. Yes, right. Tell you, one of the biggest problems we have in the church world today is Christians who are pansies. When the Word of God talks about People who will not inherit the kingdom of God. In one place, the Apostle Paul says, he uses the word effeminate. And it's funny because many translators have tried to translate that word as meaning homosexual. And many gay lesbian people have had that passage of scripture thrown at them. Oh, the Bible said the effeminate will not get into the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah, glory to God. Well, first of all, honey, I know a lot of gay men who are not effeminate. Right. Number one. Right. I also know a lot of effeminate men who are not gay. True. I know some men, I swear to God, they're more like their mother than they are their dad. And they're as straight as an arrow. Amen. There's nothing wrong with effeminacy. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I, I Oh, I'm going to tick off some people today, especially Sister I hear home. Hey, you shouldn't tell people there's nothing wrong with fantasy. Let me tell you something. There is nothing wrong with a man who is very much in tune and in touch with the feminine aspects of behavior and the feminine aspects of thinking. I don't know why anybody finds offense with this. I really don't. Because there are many men out there who have a, a, a feminine uh mentality. You know, it's not just about their conduct, Johnny. It's not just about how they carry themselves, but their thinking. I've dated a number of people because I'll be honest with you, effeminacy has never bothered me in the least. I look at it, 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 you know, you look at a woman who's soft, who's sweet, who's uh, romantic, who is appreciative and grateful for things that you do for them. You know what I'm saying? The positive aspects of the female gender. And I see a man, uh, Bill, who embraces many of these. That doesn't offend me. Why in the world should it? How does that bother me? doesn't bother me in the least. Well, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of gay men who are so far from effeminate, it's not even funny. And, of course, there are some of them, you look at him and you think, my God, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, like this. And, and then, of course, the minute they start talking, oh, how are you? I'm just fine, <laughs> thank you. And you're sitting there looking and, and your brain's kind of doing a work over and you're saying, e -e -e -e, wait a minute, what's going on here? I, I'm, I'm seeing one thing, but I'm hearing something different. But, again, that, that doesn't bother me either because, you know, hey, people are people. 
But the word that's translated effeminate had to add a little lightness in there. The word that's translated effeminate literally comes from a Greek word that is simply translated soft. That's what the word simply means, soft. So the idea that homosexuals are soft is idiotic. It's, it's insane to translate that word as homosexual. But when you understand the context of the times and you understand the context of circumstances of that era, when you look at the Word of God as a whole, you understand that A, the word soft, it, that same word soft, the same concept of soft, is applied to the wealthy, the rich. Jesus said, when you went to see John in the wilderness, what did you go to see? Did you go to see a man in soft clothing? Did you go to see a man with soft raiment? What did that mean? That meant, did you go to see a man of great wealth who was living this opulent, soft, comfortable, cozy lifestyle? Because soft in ancient times was associated with wealth. The more money you had, the more comfortable you could make your life. Well, it's the same thing in the world today, isn't it? The more money you got, the more comfortably you can live. Amen. You know, uh, I'm sure that Rick Gates can have a whole lot more uh, fancy bedding than I've got. I'm sure he can afford a better mattress on his bed than Tommy and I have. Am I telling the truth? I'm sure he can afford more sumptuous uh, bedspreads and covers and comforters. I'm sorry, he'll probably have a duvet. I'm sure that these men can afford to have a whole lot softer and more comfortable a life. So the term soft is associated oftentimes with the wealthy. And the word of God said, Jesus said, it's easier for a rich man to get through the, uh, a camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven, didn't he? So the term effeminate should simply be translated soft, and the term soft should be understand probably understood probably as wealth, men of great wealth and opulence of lifestyle. But then another writer that I read said that at the same time, the Apostle Paul could have been referring to those who caved in easily to pressure because the church was under a great deal of persecution in the early days. Many Christians were being thrown to the lions, weren't they, in ancient Rome. Many Christians were being stoned in Paul's day. Paul stood there and held the clothes, uh, the coats of those men who stoned the apostle Stephen. So there was a lot of uh, great difficulty that the early church went through. And some have suggested perhaps what Paul was saying was people who were soft, who were not able to stand up and endure the pressures and the troubles that came. They weren't willing to give their life for their, uh, for their faith, Johnny. They weren't willing to stand up to the tribulation. I will tell you a little secret. We got a whole bunch of effeminate people in the church today. And I mean a whole bunch. Matter of fact, probably the majority. We got a whole bunch of soft people in our world today. The Bible said they that would be rich fall into a snare. Honey, if you want to live soft, you're falling into a snare. If it's your desire to have the easiest life, because the more money you got, the easier you can make it, and the softer you can make it, the Word of God said you've fallen into a snare, you've fallen into a trap. Just that mindset alone is enough to cause you to fall into the trap. And there are so many Christians in our world today. Oh, God is nothing but a genie in a bottle. If I rub the bottle, he'll come out and grant me my wishes. Hello now. Oh, I just have to pray in Jesus' name. Lord, I want that Cadillac in Jesus' name. Lord, I want that Rolls Royce in Jesus' name. Lord, I want that Bentley in Jesus' name. Word of God said, you have not because you ask not. He said, but listen, don't just read that and stop. He goes on to say, and you have, and when you do, you ask, you ask amiss. So when you do ask, the things you ask for are asinine. 
And you ain't going to get those things. You can ask for them till the cows come home, but they're not going to come your way. We got a bunch of soft Christians in our world today. They can't stand up to any pressure. That's why they fight these wars in our society. Oh, where there's a culture war going on. They fight against a secular culture because, God forbid, they have to try to keep their faith and hold their faith in a secular society. Got news for you, honey. I can go to high school. I can go to college. I can learn everything there is to learn about secular science and secular belief about how the world was made. I can repeat it back to you. I can pass the test. I can answer every question. And I simply have put it in my mind in a category of this is the way secular society believes it to be. It's that easy. I went to high school and at one point, I'm sorry, in middle school, we had a, a science teacher named Miss Mayer. And Miss Mayer happened to be Jewish. And at one point she announced that beginning next week, we're going to begin to study evolution. Well, I was in seventh grade at the time. So next week came, well, I used to carry a Bible to school with me. And at the beginning of the class, I said, Mrs. Mayor, may I say something? She said, sure, Charles. What, what do you want to say? I stood up and I opened my Bible. I said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. And I began to read Genesis, or I, began, I didn't read it, I quoted it. I began to quote it from memory. And after I got through about, you know, the first several verses, I stopped. I said, man, we can study evolution until the cows come home. I said, but I'm going to tell you a little secret. I will always believe God created the heavens and the earth. Hallelujah. And every student in my classroom applauded me, literally. I'll never forget this as long as I live. I've had some interesting moments in my life. And Miss Mayer stopped and she said, you know something, Charles? She said, I'm Jewish. She said, I've got to tell you, she said, that was the most eloquent quoting I've ever heard of Genesis 1. She said, I'm amazed. She said, you know what? Let's just table this for a little bit. So let me talk to the principal and, and we'll get back to this tomorrow. The next day she came to class and said, the principal's given me permission to move on with our syllabus. We're just going to bypass the evolution studies. Now there's some people watching and they say, well, I believe in evolution. I'm a Christian and I still believe in evolution. Well, that's your privilege. If you won't believe that, you believe that. I got news for you. There's a lot of science that, that contradicts evolution, whether you want to believe that or not. Uh, and there are some brilliant minds in our world that, I mean brilliant minds, that are not religious. That has nothing to do with religion who will tell you that especially since the discovery of DNA and these sorts of things, that evolution, the theory, no longer holds water. But it's become the popular thought and minds that want to discard and disbelieve God choose to continue to embrace this mentality because it satisfies their uh, desire to explain somehow or another how things came to be without God being part of the process. But if you want to believe in evolution, believe in it. I wasn't trying to make Mrs. Mayer not teach on evolution. That was not my plan. And later in my studies, in high school and what have you, we did study evolution. And if somebody asked me about evolution, I can tell you all about it. I can tell you all about what uh, you know, uh, Darwin had to say, and I can tell you all about uh, natural selection. I can tell you all about these things because I've simply put it in my mind in the category of this is secular thought and this is secular belief. But we got a lot of Christians in our world today, Johnny, bless God, they can't do that. Oh no, I've got to prevent this from even coming into my hearing. I've got to prevent this from coming into the hearing of my children. Why? Well, because I'm soft. I'm a weakling. I can't stand up to the pressures of anything that would contradict my faith. Am I telling the truth today? Uh -huh. I want to tell you something, folks. God, listen to me now. 
because we're going through a we're going through a, a thing in our political system in our country today that has been caused by a bunch of soft people, bunch of people who. Bill and Johnny, they don't ever want to wind up in the lion's den. Well, I got news for you, honey. Uh, God don't always deliver us from winding up in the lion's den. Bill, God doesn't always prevent us from experiencing cancer. God doesn't always prevent us from experiencing sickness or disease. God doesn't always prevent us from experiencing addiction. God doesn't always prevent us from going through troubles and trials and hardships. No, Daniel had to wind up in the lion's den. He wound up where he really would have preferred not to have been to begin with. The question is, do we have the faith to look at the lion and say, Ah, shut up. Right. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Do we have the faith to believe God that even in spite of the situation that God has allowed us to be entered into, that no harm will come our way? Can we go to college and can we learn about evolution and know that when it's all said and done, we're still going to believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Amen. Do we have the faith to know that no matter what our outside circumstance, God is able to keep us even in the midst of that circumstance? No, we got Christians in the world today. Oh, I'm praying and asking God. I don't want to have to go through this. I don't want to have to go through that. I don't want to have to experience this. I don't want to have to experience that. Um, honey, got news for you. The only way your faith grows is when God is able to put a little pressure on your faith muscle. Your muscles don't grow unless you apply some pressure, some weight, some resistance. What causes your muscles to grow is when you learn to resist, am I telling the truth today, when you learn to resist the pressure of gravity upon the weights that you're pushing up on the bench. It's called resistance. You've heard the term resistance training. Nowhere do you have training where you're supposed to build your muscle, you'll never hear a bodybuilder say, Oh, I, I built my body sitting on the sofa watching soap operas. I was eating bonbons and drinking Coca-Cola and my body just swelled up like this and now I can lift the boss. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you never seen that, have you? No, because if you're going to build your body, you've got to experience resistance. There's an old saying in, in the weightlifting uh, field and in working out, and of course it's a saying I've never really fully embraced, uh, no pain, no gain. Got news for you, children. Your faith ain't never going nowhere if your faith is never tried. Hello now. The Word of God said when we go through trials and tribulations and difficulties, we are like gold that is being tried in the fire. So that when we come out of that fire, we've been purifying. All the unclean elements in that gold have risen to the top and been skimmed off. But you can't get the unclean elements in the gold to come out, Johnny, where you can get rid of them until you melt the gold down. Gold is one of the hardest, or it's a soft substance, but it's uh, one of the heaviest substances. But you can't, you can take a piece of gold ore, and in that gold ore is going to be little bits of dirt and little bits of stuff that don't belong there. And you're not just going to melt that down and pour it into a, a form to create a ring or to create a brooch. No, because if you do, you're going to have some dirty gold. First, you've got to melt that gold down and you've got to skim off the, the lighter elements that float to the top because that dirt and that 
uh, stuff that would uh, otherwise pollute it has to be removed. Am I telling the truth? The Word of God said when we go through hard times, when we go through tribulations and trials, you're going through that battle right now with addiction. You're going through that battle right now with alcoholism. You're going through that battle right now with sickness. You're going through that battle right now at your job. You're going through that battle right now with your family. You're going through that battle right now with your schooling you're struggling and you feel like you're in the lion's den you feel like you've been set up to fail am I telling the truth you ever felt that way you ever felt like Lord I'll tell you what I've been somebody done set me up to fail I'm in a position where I'm going to lose no matter how I look at it if I wind up in that spot God help me because ain't going to be nothing else is going to be able to when I tell the truth. But all I want to tell you today, God is able to shut up the mouth of the lion. Hallelujah. And if we are walking in faith, if we're trusting God, when the devil comes our way and whispers in our ear, you've been struggling with this addiction for so many years. You're never going to be free of it. You're never going to be delivered from it. Just look at that old lion who's making noise and say, Ah, shut up. Because Daniel didn't stay in the den forever, did he? He didn't stay there until he was destroyed. No, he was brought out of the den and there was no manner of hurt found on him. In 1 Peter 5 and 8, the Word of God tells us, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Yeah, the enemy's working against you. You can count on that. You can bet on the fact that he is looking to destroy you. The word of God said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. If a lion comes up on a pack of hyenas that have downed a a zebra, you know that lion's going to make some noise, isn't he? He's going to start to roar because he wants to scare off those uh, hyenas so he can get hold of their prey. They've done the work. It saves him all the work of having to hunt. Saves him all the work of having to chase after and pounce on that prey. Oh, it's somebody else's food, it's somebody else's dinner, but if he comes upon it, he'll make noise. Why? Because a roaring lion is one that's trying to intimidate. If you've ever noticed, a hunting lion does not roar. You ever watched a nature program? You ever watched something on television about lions when they hunt? Do you ever see a lion roaring while it's hunting? No. No, they're very quiet. They're very stealth. Johnny, they get down on their fours, they get down on the ground, and they try to hide themselves as close to the ground as they can. And they blend in with the tall grass, am I telling the truth? And what they do is they look for the weak ones. They look for the young and the old. They look for those who are the most susceptible to being separated from the rest of the pack. I'm going to tell you something today, folks. If you've separated yourself from the church of the living God, if you've separated yourself from the herd, you may not believe me. You don't have to believe me. But it's the Word of God. You are putting yourself in a dangerous position. You need us and we need you. Amen. Yeah, yeah. There is safety in numbers. Amen. Even sheep herders, they can herd their sheep. And as long as they have their sheep in a big old tight grouping, the wolves and the foxes and the bears aren't going to try to attack an entire flock of sheep. No, they wait for one of them to wander off. They wait for one of them to get lost or to get tangled up somewhere. They wait for one to be too sick or too weak to keep up with the rest of us. If you've allowed your faith in God to weaken, if you've allowed your walk with God to fail you, if you're, if you're weak, if you're sick in your faith today, and you're beginning to wander away from the pack, you have put yourself in great danger. Because Satan, like a roaring lion, 
walketh about seeking whom he may devour. A lion roars to intimidate. He roars to scare away others from his food. Amen. You let a pack of hyenas come up on a lion who's dining on that fallen ox. And guess what's going to happen? That lion's going to start roaring, isn't he? Stay away from my food. Don't you come. He's trying to intimidate. I'm going to tell you something, honey. The enemy loves to make a lot of noise. He loves to intimidate. I, You know, the Word of God doesn't tell us, but when... Daniel went down into that lion's den. God knows he probably heard a lot of roaring. Get away from me. Stay away from my wife. Stay away from my kids. There may have been some leftovers there that they were still munching on from previous meals. Who knows? They were letting Daniel know, we're intimidating you. We're trying to scare you away. Stay off to the side. Don't come near us. We don't want you too close. Because when a lion wants to intimidate, it'll begin to roar. I'm going to tell you, a lot of us go through experiences in our life, whether it be in our jobs, whether it be while we're at school, whether it be in response to something the doctors told us, whether it be in response to addiction and struggles that we're going through, and we'll hear the lion roar. He wants to intimidate us. I'm going to tell you, let the doctor look at you and say you've got cancer and see if you don't hear the lion roar. Sure. Struggle with addiction, struggle with alcoholism, Johnny, and see if when you lay your head down at night and you're saying, God, I don't understand why I'm going through this. I wish to God, Lord, you would just deliver me from this addiction. And it's not happening right away. And you say, is it ever going to happen? And the enemy comes along and says, no, it'll never happen, Roar. The spirit of doubt comes in and roars. The spirit of fear comes in and roars. The spirit of unbelief comes in and roars. Hallelujah. And if we're smart, we'll look that old devil in the eye. And we'll say, what? Ah, shut up. Hallelujah. You're trying to intimidate. You're trying to make me afraid. You're trying to make me Fearful, but I have faith in God, and I know I've been faithful to Him, and I know that when you've been faithful to Him, He will be nothing less than faithful to me. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. The Word of God says in Isaiah 54, verse 17, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Listen. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. God has promised no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. Hallelujah. I may wind up in the den, but the lions are what I'm afraid of, not the den. I'm not afraid of the struggle. I'm not afraid of the circumstance because the circumstance can't kill me. It's the lions in my circumstance that have the potential of destroying me. So all i got to do is keep my faith in God and know that God honors consistency and God honors faithfulness. There are people that we love that are faithful in supporting and watching this ministry who have been part of this church online for a long, long time now. There's one lady, bless her heart, Amy, who has tithed and giving given to this church. And if it wasn't for her help, we wouldn't be able to do half of what we do. And that young lady has been faithful and she's been supportive. And she tells me, she said, on Monday when I go to work, she said, I, I put your message on from Sunday and I listen to it. This gal's been faithful. Amy, I got news for you. He comes. I'm going to tell you something, honey. God will be just as faithful to you as you've been to him.
Whatever den you're in, I'm telling you, sweetheart, God's going to bring you out of the den. Hallelujah. You're going to wind up out of the den. But in the meantime, when the lion roars, when the spirit of doubt and when the spirit of unbelief and the spirit of fear and that demon tries to intimidate you, look him in the eye and say, Ah, shut up! Hallelujah. No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. In Romans the 8th chapter, trying to wind down to today. Verses 35 and 37, the word of God said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But then Paul says in verse 37, Nay, he said, no, not so. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. What did Paul say? He said, in all these things. In other words, God doesn't prevent tribulation. God doesn't prevent distress. God doesn't prevent persecution. God doesn't prevent famine. He doesn't prevent nakedness or peril or sword. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Hallelujah. So we may wind up in the lion's den. But we will not wind up in the lions. Hallelujah. Oh, the doctor, I'm going to tell you, years and years and years ago, the doctor looked at me and said, you got something going on in your body, and I got news for you. Uh, it's likely to take your life within a year. And I went home, and I said, oh, Lord, I'm in the lion's den, and I'm hearing the roar. I'm hearing those animals make a lot of noise. They're intimidating me. They're trying to cause fear. They're trying to cause unbelief. They're trying to cause distress. But Lord, I believe you, and I've tried everything in my power to be faithful. I've tried everything in my power to do the right thing. And I know that you honor those who honor you. And therefore, Lord, when that lion starts to roar, I'm just going to look him in the eye and say, I shut up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's victory for the Christian who can look the enemy in the eye when he begins to bark and he begins to growl and he begins to roar. When we can look the enemy in the eye and tell him, ah, shut up, keep your mouth closed. I've had to go up against demons. I've cast demons out of people and they have had noises and sounds coming out of their mouth, Johnny, that put I mean to tell you, they'll make every hair on your head stand up and every hair on your body. I've heard sounds come out of human beings that you wouldn't expect to come out of a bear. Or you wouldn't expect to come. I'm, I'm not even joking, folks. I'm serious. I've heard voices come out of human beings in multitude of voices. Not just one voice, but several voices literally simultaneously speaking out of the mouth of one human being. Now, I don't know how anybody going to tell me scientifically that's possible. You only got one set of vocal cords. And when you've got what sounds like eight or ten voices literally speaking in unison, they're all saying the same thing. But you're literally hearing a multitude of voices coming out of a human mouth. And I've gone up against demons and I've had them look at me and they begin, they want to resist, you know. They want to try to uh, throw me off track and distract me and they'll begin to say things. And you know what the first thing I say to them is, shut up! Hallelujah, shut up devil! And I mean immediately, Johnny, their mouths closed. All of a sudden, there are no more sound coming out. It doesn't matter how scary they're trying to be. It doesn't matter how intimidating they're trying to be. All of a sudden, I've watched demon-possessed people go silent. Because I spoke in the authority of the Holy Ghost. I spoke to them in the power of Jesus' name and said, Shut up! And they immediately go quiet. You're not going to intimidate me. You're not, you're not going to cause me to be fearful. 
You're not going to cause me to step away from the task at hand. You're not going to cause me to abstain from testing you out. You might as well just shut up now. Believer today, whatever your circumstance, whatever your situation, you need to understand there isn't a thing in the world that has separated you from the love of God. Your being LGBT has not separated you from the love of God. And I'm here to tell you that in all these circumstances, in all these situations, in all these trials and tribulations and sickness and disease, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Oh, I'm telling you right now, Johnny, I'm 18 years, excuse me, no, 20 years now. My Lord have mercy. This coming October be 20 years I walked out of Yelma Haven Hospital. After them telling me I had 24 hours to live, day after day after day for a month, not telling me so much as telling my family because I was unconscious much of the time. But you see, I was in the lion's den, but I never wound up in the lion. Hallelujah. And when the time came and I was offered the opportunity to believe God or die, I chose to believe God. When Brother Ronnie sent that prayer cloth and his church had prayed over it, I said, Lord, they're believing you for a miracle, so I'm going to believe you for a miracle. Hey there, devil, I shut up. Because for a long time, Johnny, I was believing, you know, well, maybe it's just your time. Maybe you're, you know, you're going to die. This is just the time that it's going to happen. And I wasn't afraid of death, but I just had come to believe that God wasn't going to heal me. He wasn't going to uh, deliver me from this sickness. But then when they sent that prayer cloth, I realized, wait a minute, i got people believing God for me. i got old King Darius up there. Hello now. And he says, hey, you've been faithful. One of the things that Brother Ronnie said to me in the letter he sent in effect was, Brother, you've been faithful to God all this time. Surely God's going to be faithful to you. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, if you're faithful to God, children, you better believe God's going to be faithful to you. Amen. You may be in the den, but you won't be in the lion. And you need to speak to the spirit of doubt. You need to speak to the spirit of fear. But, oh, but this situation at my job, it's overwhelming me. Speak to the lion and say, I ah, shut up. This situation in school, my studies, they're overwhelming me. I don't, I don't know if I'm, I can get a hold of this subject. I don't know if I can pass this course. I don't know why I'm saying what I'm saying. It has to be prophetic. Somebody out there needs to hear the exact words I'm speaking. You need to look at the lion and say, lion, shut up. Hallelujah. Ah, shut up. I don't need to hear your intimidation. I don't need to hear your fear-mongering. Lastly today, sometimes we hear our illness, our depression, our addiction saying, you're not ever going to escape my grasp. But as children of God, we must, learn, we must lean on God's power and say, Ah, shut up! You may roar over my weakened, sick, afflicted soul, but my God will shut up the mouth of the lion. Hallelujah. Amen. Do you believe that today? Amen. 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 Would you stand with me? Amen. Praise God and amen.